Praise God. What a blessing. Amen. So we've got them one step closer. Now we, uh, I, I keep saying my dream would be if we could buy about a thousand acres somewhere and all of us build a house on it and we got enough room where if we if we get on the outs a little bit you can you can stay on your side of the thousand and I'll stay on mine but Miss Jessica can teach the kids every day at school and then when they get out about lunchtime they can just wander through the woods and the hollers and hunt raccoons and squirrels for supper time. So what a wonderful life that would be. Amen. I believe the Lord will put us together in heaven. Amen. Mansion. Mansions close enough to each other. So thankful for the hope that we have in Jesus. The Christian life is definitely not an easy life. At times we have to say goodbye to people that we really love, but I was just reminded of the Apostle Paul. He said, if I only have hope in this life, I'm of all men most miserable. I'm glad my hope is not bound to this life. It's, it's not bound to emergency rooms and funeral homes and graveyards. But those that believe upon Jesus have been given eternal life. That's life that never ends. God's building an eternal family. That's our mission here at this church, to help populate heaven and to plunder hell and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He alone saves, He alone forgives sin, He alone gives eternal life. And He does that through His sacrifice on the cross, that He laid down His life and took our sin, our judgment, and our punishment there so that we could go free, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be cleansed, and so that we could be brought into the family of God. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to ask you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of Romans. While you're turning there, I just want to remind you this is going to be a very busy day of ministry. We've got a lot going on after the service. Uh, young people are going to the nursing home where they minister, they preach, and they tag team preach and tag team sing at the nursing home. And it's a, it's a wonderful time to be. If you want to go just to witness it or to be a part of it, you're welcome to. It begins at 2.30 at the hospital in Eupora. Then also tonight at 5.00. Uh, we're going to have another uh, worship service. Um, Sunday nights are wonderful. They, they really are. The presence of God is just so uh, very genuine and precious. And so we, we encourage you to come. I've always wondered why do people come on Sunday morning and get touched and get blessed by the Lord. And then on Sunday night or Wednesday night, they don't come back. I, I just want everything that God has for me. Amen. And I want to be in His presence with His people. And, and listen, when you come, it's, you're, you're not only doing that for yourself, but it's an encouragement to others. You know, some of you just being here this morning is an encouragement to me that you're not giving up, you're not letting the enemy win in your life. You, you fight through, and, and we fight on, and we fight together. Amen? The, the enemy wants to isolate you. That's why sometimes it's such a warfare to get to church on a Sunday morning because the enemy knows the power that we have in agreement. Jesus said, where two or three of us gather, he is there. Where two or three of us agree on anything on earth, it will be done in heaven. We need one another. Amen? We are the body of Christ. We're, I, I'm a member of the body, and I thank God that I have a place in His body. But I don't think for a minute that I'm able to do everything that God wants to do in this town, in this ministry, in this church. I need you. You need me. We need one another. Amen. And, and when, you, when you come to church and you bring your faith, it, it puts things in motion. What does it take to move God? It takes faith. Amen. And, and faith is not silent. It doesn't just sit there. Faith expresses itself. Faith pursues God. 
Faith prays. Faith believes. Faith lays its hand on the sick. Faith lifts its hands and opens its mouth and praises God and just defies all the lies of the devil. My God is good. I'm not forsaken. I'm not forgotten about. For Jesus said He would never leave me or forsake me. He's in our midst today. Oh, I thank You. Even though this world might be going down, God's church is going up. Amen? One day soon, we're going to be really going up. <laughs> and all our troubles will be over. I want to read one verse this morning, Romans 5 and verse 17. It says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me as we get into the Word this morning? Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the way that You have already ministered to us. I've been so helped this morning, Lord. And I thank You that You know right what we need just when we need it. God, I thank You for Your Spirit in this place. I pray for Your anointing upon the reading, preaching, and hearing of the Word of God today. Lord, help us to receive it in faith that this Word might profit us, that it might benefit our lives, that it might help us today. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 I want to speak to you continuing on the thought I began last Sunday morning about the overcoming life. And the Christian life is met with great resistance. It's it's not easy to live for Jesus, especially in the world that we're in. It's not popular. You know, there, a lot of people go to church, but the, the number reduces drastically by those that are going to love and live for Jesus tomorrow. Amen? A lot happens between Sunday and Monday. But Jesus said that this was a narrow way that leads to life and only a few would find it. And we're blessed this morning to be surrounded by those that believe and want and desire the same things that we, that we want. And they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Last Sunday we talked about three things. This is an old saying in the church. I heard it when I was a kid. But if you're going to overcome, it's these three elements. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The, the world... We can see easily the wickedness in our world. We can see the culture that's shifting. We can see values and things that used to matter. You know, some of you uh, older folks, you know, the things that you see today that people do and it's an everyday thing, you probably never even heard of that when you were a kid. And it's evidence and proof that the world is not getting better it is getting worse. And if you're not careful, the world will entice you. It will sweep you in. You know, we know worldly things. Some of it are obviously bad. Drinking, drugs, uh, uh, fornication, all types of things like that. But other times, Jesus said, it's the cares of the world, the cares of life that chokes out the Word in people and makes it it makes it unfruitful. It makes it unprofitable. You know, you can just have a hard week and you can feel spiritually drained as a result of it. And the enemy, he preys on that and he, and he tells you that God's not with you. He, he tells you that God is not helping you. And, and as a Christian, we've got to overcome the world. Jesus said that in this world we would have tribulation, but fear not because He has overcome the world. And, 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 and it's looking to what Christ did for us that, that overcomes the world. The, the next is the flesh. The, the worst problem that you have and I have you looked at it in the mirror when you got up this morning and we have to be able to admit that we have to know we all have a flesh Paul said in Romans chapter 7 I know that in my flesh that is within me dwelleth no good thing look at your neighbor and say there's nothing good in you <laughs> nothing good in you if there's anything good inside of you or your neighbor it's because God put it there amen it's because the Holy Spirit has done a work inside of them that, that God, God produces good, but that flesh, it always has an excuse. 
It's always offended. It can always give you five reasons why. It can't believe the Word of God. It can't get to church. It's five reasons why it's their fault and not my fault. Jesus said if you're going to follow Him, first you have to deny yourself. That's your flesh. We all have two different wills living inside of us. You have yourself, your flesh, what's best for me right now in the moment. And then you have the will of God. Deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow Jesus. So to, over, to live an overcoming life, you have to overcome your flesh. And la- the last one is the devil. The devil is our adversary. There are times he entices us to sin. Other times I think one of his greatest weapons is discouragement. When you look around where you've poured a lot in, you've, you've sown a lot, you've worked a lot, maybe you've prayed for someone, and not just with sickness, but you, you know, you're praying like, uh, like you were this morning for your brother, you know, and sometimes we go to pray for people that they get saved or their life gets turned around, but instead of them getting closer to God, it gets worse, and you can feel the discouragement of that, right? You can feel the weight of that. You can have thoughts like, why should I, why should I keep going? But, you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus defeated the devil on the cross. That, that Jesus removed him from power in our life. And what you have to understand as a Christian is your life is not in Satan's hand. God hasn't turned you over to him to torment you, to molest you, to pervert you, to tear you apart. But your life is in the hands of a loving father. You are the potter and he is the clay. And there are times that God will use the devil and give him access into your life to tempt you, to try you you, to sift you as wheat. And Jesus said, Peter, when Peter was going through a time like that, I have prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. There are times that we fail, y'all, but our faith should not fail. And God said to Peter, Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. But there are times, y'all, that we will go through great pain and great heartache and it will feel like God is a million miles away. But on the other side of it, we'll see that if we remain faithful to Him and to His gospel, that God has done something in my heart. God has produced weakness in me and has broken pride off of me. And i found that it's in my weakness that God's strength is made perfect. And as we go through things and we find the way of God, and the work of the Spirit in our life, now we are able to comfort those that are in the same place that God delivered us from. So the Christian life is an overcoming life. One thing that I've been thinking of this week is the parable of the sower. and may speak more on that tonight, but Jesus said in Matthew 13 and verse 21, He was talking about the seed that fell among the stones and the rocks and the stony places. It began to come up, but Jesus said He had no root in Himself. But He endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the Word, by and by He is offended. So this seed was planted and because it didn't have any root, it didn't last very long. Roots are things that are beneath the surface. Something that has no root, a Christian that has no root is one who has only had a superficial experience with Christ but hasn't allowed Jesus to penetrate deep down into their soul to where it's truly life changing. Do they really see that old man is crucified with Christ and I've been raised with Him to walk in newness of life? And because it doesn't have roots, I'm saying, you understand, it might have got touched at the altar and I'm not denying that or taken away from that. But y'all, it's got to translate in tomorrow. Jesus, I need you today. Let my roots go deep. Oh God, touch the inner recesses of my soul so that I'm not going back. And if you don't, you'll only endure for a while. That's for a season. How many people, y'all, have we seen just come and go on fire for God, but it doesn't last very long because persecution and pressure comes. 
and God will allow it. You get on fire for Jesus, you're going to find your friends that you thought were your friends really weren't your friends. You're going to find yourself alone. You know what I've had to learn to do? Embrace loneliness. Instead of mourning about those that walked out of your life, you know what I've learned? You need to start thanking God for removing that out of your life. Because I I couldn't get to the next level that God's trying to take me to, trying to walk on eggshells so that I don't hurt your feelings or say something that you don't like. Thank God for the ones that had to leave because God made room for other people. God will allow times for persecution and offense to come into your life. But it will refine your faith if you let it. It will teach you this is not about me. I've had 10,000 reasons to get offended and to lay down and quit. But this is not about me. Deny yourself and pick up the cross and follow Jesus. God says, for I reckon that my present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in me. There's purpose in it, y'all. There's purpose in everything in every valley that God leads His children into. The Bible says that because persecution and pressure come, He is offended. The word offended means there's a stumbling block. I was following Jesus and the path was so clear and I had so much joy. But then one day came a stumbling block. And you know what now you've got? You've got a choice to make. Are you going to let what they did to you, what they said, what they didn't do, are you going to let that define your Christianity? Or are you going to let what Jesus did for you give you the grace to climb right over that stumbling block and keep on going with Jesus? There will be stumbling blocks. You hear me? People will leave. People will hurt you. People will die sometimes that you prayed for and you believed God for. But I'm telling you, Christianity is not just for comfort and ease in this life. But the Bible says that we're looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And everything that you go through, God has a purpose in it. Listen, the more that we need to see and feel, it reveals the less we have on the inside. The Bible says that the the Jews seek a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. I don't have to have a sign. Jesus said the only sign you're going to get is the sign of the prophet Jonah because the Son of Man will be in the belly of earth for three days and then He will rise again. That's all the sign that I need to know that God loves me. It's got nothing to do with how much money we've got in the bank or the way that I feel this morning, but I know because the Bible tells me so that 2,000 years ago, God's Son laid it all down on a hill cover Calvary because he loves me. It, faith isn't always seen with the eye or felt with the emotions. Think about Job. It looked like if you would have seen with your physical eye, it looked like Job lost everything. His family's dead. All his wealth is gone. If you could have felt what Job felt like, imagine your body, your physical body covered with boils. Imagine your heart shattered into a thousand pieces. It didn't look good and it didn't feel good. That man felt grief and he felt sorrow. But I want to tell you what the Bible says after Job got all that bad news, he went outside, bowed himself to the ground and worshiped God. And to the natural eye, it didn't look like much. But if you could see it in the spirit, Nathan Pittman, that old man sitting in that ash heap beat every devil in hell. Because he knew, I don't need things and people. I just need God. God says in Romans 8, 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. You know how you become more than a conqueror? 
The enemy takes your family and all your money and it drove you to the feet of Jesus. They can take everything that I have, but God, they cannot take you. I don't need things and I don't need people. I just need God. You know what it was? That's an overcoming life. It's an overcoming life. There has to be more to us, y'all, than what people know about. There has to be more spirituality than what people see on a Sunday morning. If all I got is one sermon on Sunday and a few songs, you know what that is? I've got no root. And when the trials and tribulations come, you're going to look around and I won't be here anymore. There's got to be more revelation than what you share with others. It's got to be a secret place. Sister Candace told us Wednesday, uh, Sunday night that if we'll be with him in the secret place, it'll be evidenced in the public place. Let me just tell you, don't crave ministry. Don't crave the platform. Don't crave the microphone. Crave Jesus. Crave Jesus. All the microphones and the platforms in the world, they won't bring the presence of Jesus. You know who brings the presence of Jesus? People that have been in the secret place. People that have been broken. People that have been in their own ash heap and felt the pain and felt the lies of the devil. But they can also tell you what it is for Jesus to reach down into that ash heap, Job, and to pull you up and to let you stand again and to give you the testimony that overcomes hell. There's got to be a bigger dream and vision in your heart than what you share with others. Listen to me. How do we know that David killed a lion and a bear? Because he told us. <laughs> no video cameras there. He didn't run around back bragging about that. But for several years, that shepherd boy was carrying that on the inside of him. They thought you can't be king. They wanted everybody else. You go out here and you take care of those sheep. But what they didn't know, there was more happening than they knew about in the shepherd's field. Oh, a lion came to take my father's sheep and I rose up in the anointing of the Spirit. I grabbed him by the beard and I slew him because it's... It's not about me. It's about the sheep. Another day a bear came. Oh, I didn't have any help. I didn't have a 44 Magnum. And my brothers wasn't there. And I wasn't going to run. You know, hirelings run when the, when the wolf comes, when the bear comes. But I'm not a hireling. My father put me right here to tend to these sheep. So I had to rise up and grab that bear by the paw. And God delivered him into my hand. David was carrying that on the inside. And it wasn't until he's just going through the mundane things of life taking bread and cheese to his brothers who didn't like him you know what you do to people who don't like you serve them love them bless them <laughs> pray for them there are times God has given me incredible peace that I didn't have until I begin to pray for my enemies not that they would get what's coming to them but God I pray that you bless them in every way possible I don't want to walk around carrying anger towards them. I don't want to walk around wounded. And you know what they say? Hurt people do what? Hurt people. You know what? You know what when you got hurt was? That was a stumbling block put in your path. And now we're about to see. Do you have root in yourself? Roots are deep down. That stumbling blocks in your way, man, they hurt you. It took the breath right out of you. I can't believe they did that to me. You know what your choices are? Man, let them roots go down into the ground. Just take that into the presence of Jesus. Don't pick up the phone and five call five people and get them all on your side. And let me tell you what you need to tell them. Leave all that alone. 
Run into the presence of Jesus and say, God, I'm hurting. God, I'm angry. God, there's murder in my heart at this moment. But I can't be what you've called me to be with murder in my heart. Will you touch me? Will you deal with this heart? And you know what's happening in the spirit? Those roots are going down deep. And it's touching Jesus. And it's changing you. And you're dying your own death on that cross. And you're saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know what just happened? You begin to live the overcoming life. Overcoming means there was a fight. It implies there was an obstacle in your way and you overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony because you love not your own life even unto the death. David's carrying all this on the inside of him. You may not think I'm the one God's going to use, but God don't see like you see. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, God don't see like you see. (laughs) David can defeat that giant because there's more to him than meets the eye in that secret place, out in that pasture. That's what God wants to do with us. Listen, I believe I'm looking at people this morning. There's more to you than meets the eye. Tell your neighbor this morning, there's more to me than what you know. Tell them I've cried tears you didn't see. I've built altars that you weren't there. I've prayed prayers that you didn't get to hear. I've got dreams that you didn't get. I am rooted and I am grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ and I am an overcomer. That's what I am. Hallelujah. That's what God's doing. Man, we didn't show up on a Sunday morning to put on a show. How many altars have you built, Kyle? How many tears have you cried? How many times have you just felt like an old empty cup and I got nothing to give? And I don't feel like doing this anymore. But then the Holy Spirit reminds you, Son... It's not about you and what you want. When I called you, I didn't call you for a season when you were on the mountaintop. I called you for the rest of your life. I gave you a promise. I showed my boys this week. I remember sitting on the floor in what's now Carter's room in the house, scared to death. It's in my heart to start a church, and I I just need God, right? And I said, God, if I'm getting myself into this, I don't want it. Because I know the glory of it fades. The platform fades. And I don't want into anything. If you're not going, don't carry me there. The Lord gave me that promise in Exodus 33, 14. My presence will go with you and I will surely give you rest. I remember just taking that Bible, setting it down, and I just, I just, I just slid down in the. I just melted down into the floor, and God was writing that promise on my heart. And I can't tell you how many times I felt like I can't put, I can't put one foot in front of the other. And God quickens that word. You remember what I said to you, son? My presence will go with you, and I will surely give you rest. Just like he said to Moses, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. What a promise. That helps us to overcome. You know, the overcoming life is a life where Jesus reigns. To the word reign that I read to you in Romans 5, 17, they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. Tell your neighbor, God wants you to reign in life. The word reign, it means to be as a king, to, to have power. But listen to me, there's only one life that reigns. That's the life of Jesus. There's only one overcomer. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, as we've been teaching it, God sees all of humanity through the lens of two people. The first one is Adam. 
You know what reigns in Adam's life? Sin. The law of sin and death. Everything around him, it collapses. He tears it down. He blames other people because he's not willing to look in the mirror and to be honest with God. But you know what reigns in the life of Jesus? Grace. Grace reigns through righteousness by Christ Jesus our Lord. And where grace reigns, that is the place where the life overcomes. It's not a place where sin reigns. According to Romans 5.17... There are two things that we need to reign in life. He said, they that receive the abundance of grace. I need an abundance of grace. Listen to me. Grace is not just for you to get in the kingdom. It's for you to live in the kingdom. Grace is God coming and doing in you, through you, for you, what you cannot do on your own. You know who lives an overcoming life? People that are greatly helped by the Lord because you're never going to do it on your own. There's not a one of us that's not set out to do it on our own and you do good for three or four days. You know, somebody says something to you and I'm not mad. (laughs) I'm not going to let that bother me. You ever said that? Then the more you think about it, the more it starts bothering you. Then you don't let them have it at work, but then you get home and somebody said something and then you said something and it's World War III right there in the kitchen and you feel like a dog. You know what happened? You're trying to overcome in your own strength and in your own flesh. God says in Romans 8, 13, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. You'll die. There are times that flesh, it it can have well-meaning and good intentions, but God's not going to anoint that flesh to to have victory. God only will will bring victory to those that are living by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you're going to live that overcoming life, I need the abundance of of grace. I need God helping me every single day of my life. I need God's grace to preach. I need God's grace to be a husband. I need God's grace to be a daddy. I need God's grace to put a tire on, on the side of the road. They that receive an abundance of grace. It's a a super abundance. God's got more grace than we have need here this morning. Secondly, he says, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You understand this morning that righteousness is not you going out and doing a bunch of right things and say, I'm living for Jesus now, I'm righteous. God defines righteousness as a gift. A gift. You know, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that our righteousness is filthy rags. Not your unrighteousness, but your righteousness. That means that if I tried to stand before God one day and say, I was a pastor at Calvary Chapel for 38 years. I tried to help a lot of people. I gave thousands of dollars away. You know what all that is? Filthy rags. God says His righteousness is a gift. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made Him who knew no sin to become a sin offering for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In order to get God's righteousness, there has to be a transfer. And you know what you bring to the table? Sin, wickedness, rebellion, filth, All the wrong thoughts, all the wrong deeds, all the wrong words, all the rebellion against God. And you know what Jesus brings to the table? Righteousness, purity, holiness, love. I'm telling you, everything that we're lacking, not only does He bring it, but He is it. And at the cross, the two were met. At the cross, an exchange took place that Jesus took my past so that I could be given His righteousness. And through that, Josh, I received an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And God says by that, I can reign through life. Instead of everyday life overcoming me, 
By the grace of Jesus, I can overcome life. The gift of righteousness that God gives it to you. You know, as believers, we're, times we're, we're plagued by the enemy and his condemnation. And he might say to you, who are you to preach? Who are you to sing after the week you've had? Who are you to pray and ask God for anything? You know what? It's in moments like that that you need to remind Him, my righteousness was a gift from somebody else. My salvation came from another. My holiness came from another. My salvation and my righteousness, it all came from another. It came through Jesus Christ. And whenever the devil comes in with his lies, you just turn it back into praise for Jesus. Just if, for, if, for instance, if tomorrow you have a bad day, you lose your temper, you say or you, you do the wrong thing, Instead of letting the devil come in and say, you know, all that wasn't real Sunday. I saw you up there in that altar. Now look at you. Because that's what he is. He's the accuser of the brethren. The devil will always remind you of your past. He'll always remind you of your failure. But he has no idea of what your future is going to be. That's in God's hands, the author and the finisher of your faith. And when he comes accusing you, and a lot of times he will come with the fact, you should not have said that, Kyle. You should not have watched that, Wesley. You should not have did that, Miss Megan. You know what? Instead of just in condemnation, shame, and guilt, you know what that's time for? Just start thanking God for his righteousness. Just let it be all more of the reminder of why Jesus had to come and die. Lord, I thank you that you didn't come for those that have it all together, for the pretty and the plastic, but I thank you that you came for the broken, messed up people like me. I thank you that righteousness wasn't earned, but it was a gift. I thank you that you give me not just a drop of grace, but an abundance of grace. Lord, forgive me if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You know how to reign in life? is to know that you stand before God today as if you've never committed one sin in your life. How can you say that? Because that is the position that I've been given by the Lord Jesus Christ. God put me in Him. The person that I used to be crucified Him on that cross, buried with Him. And then like as Christ was raised out of that grave by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's where newness of life comes from. Not by focusing on your sin and your failure and trying not to do that, trying not to watch that, trying not to get mad but focusing on the gift that was given to you. Lord, thank you that you washed all my sins away. God, thank you that you're, you've gave me a new heart. You've given me a new mind. Lord, I'm just asking you today for grace to be able to walk in it. And that's where you're overcoming. That's where you're reigning. That's where everything the devil throws at you, you just turn it back to praise to Jesus. Listen, i got to land this plane. The Bible says, Romans 15, 17, no, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, He gives you the victory. doesn't say that He helps you win the victory or tells you, Wesley, go out there and win the victory and I'll, I'll forgive you. No, He gives us the victory. You, you've got to stop asking God for something He's already given you. Start believing, I've been given victory. Man, I'm not working towards victory. I started in victory where I was born again. He gave that to me. 
I can't lose if I started in victory. So instead of begging God, God help me, I can't quit thinking about this. I can't stop doing this. I can't, I can't, I can't. God, thank you that you've already given me victory over that. I thank you that you changed me. I'm telling you, remember, we're getting roots down in ourselves. Those roots don't go by what they see or how they feel, but they live by faith in the living Word of God. God, thank you that I'm not what my past says. I'm not what my devil says, what the devil says or what my flesh says, but I am what you say I am. I think He gave me the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've been reading this book. It's a wonderful book written by a Chinese man. And his, his name is Watchman Nee. The title of the book is The Normal Christian Life. And he was right and he said that in China's war with the Japanese, I think maybe this was, maybe it was in World War II, but he said the, uh, the Japanese had tanks and they, they would roam through their land and China just didn't have the ability to keep up with them. And so they developed a system that the snipers would shoot at the tank. That tank's just traveling through there. It's got all that heavy plated armor on it and the man is hidden down inside of the tank. You can't get to him. But that sniper would just... And then that tank would stop for a minute. And then he'd take off again. Then they'd shoot again. He'd stop, look around until finally they'd just take little shots at him. Until finally that, that man driving that tank would open the lid, stick his head out trying to, where's all this, where's all this fire? Where's these bullets coming from? And then with one carefully aimed shot, he would kill the man who popped his head out of the tank and it would be over. You know what the solution to it was? Just stay in the tank. There's no way the bullets of the enemy can get you if you'll just stay in the tank. That's the way Christianity is. The Bible says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the weapons, the fiery darts of the enemy. Just stay right there. Stay in Christ when you hear Him lying to you, when they're acting funny towards you, when they just start thanking God for what God has done for you in Christ Jesus and you know what you're doing? You're keeping your armor on because the devil wants to fight you on the grounds of flesh every time. And as spiritual as we are this morning, we all have a flesh and it's all ugly. The enemy will use people. Sometimes he'll use people that are very close to you. You can be just very tempted to step out in the flesh and tell them all the things that you've had bottled up inside that they did or that they didn't. You know what just happened? You got out of your armor. You got off the ground of the victory. And the enemy just prevailed in your life. That's how the enemy destroys homes. That's how he destroys marriages. That's how he gets children to where they don't even want to come to church anymore because they see the way we are on Sunday don't equal up to the way we are on Monday. You know what the solution to it all is? Get in that armor. Put on the whole armor of God. I don't have time. I wanted to. I don't have time to get to it this morning. But every piece of that armor is Jesus Christ. And that is where God has put you. He's your helmet. He's your breastplate. He's your belt. He's your shoes. He's your shield. He is the living word that gives you a sword to be able to fight the enemy right in the thickness, right in the heat of the battle. That is the overcoming life. It's learning to live your life in Christ Jesus. And whatever the enemy throws at me, Man, I'm not taking my armor off. I'm going to move with Him. Let me read this to you. Would you stand with me this morning? And I want to read this to you. Romans chapter 8. If you make a note of this. Romans 8, 37. He says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors 
through Him that loved us. Paul says, for I am persuaded. You know what that means? Fully convinced. There ain't a doubt in my mind. You know, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And a lot of times that's our problem. We got one foot in Jesus and then we got one foot in our own stinking thinking. And when that stumbling block is in our way and we're walking in the flesh, what do you think we're going to do? We're going to show you just how carnal we can be. Paul says, I'm persuaded. I'm fully convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities, all the forces in hell, nor powers, nor things present. That means what you're facing right now today. And I know some of you are facing things that they don't look good and they don't feel good. But I'm asking you today, let's be fully persuaded. I'm not going back. I don't have one foot in and one foot out. I am fully persuaded that things present or things to come. James, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow. God forbid should the worst phone call come tomorrow. Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's all I need to know. Is, you know what that is? That's an overcoming life. That no matter what the enemy throws at you and bombards you and plagues your life with instead of it sending you running away uh, to, to a place where you're fleeing and you're defeated it drives you to the feet of Jesus every time you know what that is? that's more than a conqueror than with what the enemy meant let's, let's be an overcoming church y'all that we're not tossed to and fro by what's going on outside but let's make the devil know if we have a bad week this week then the louder the praises are going to be in this altar and the further we're going to press in and we're going to let those roots run deep searching for that living water I'm not drying up and I'm not quitting but I'm rooted and I'm grounded in Christ there's going to be more to me than what meets the eye. You hit me in the house, I'm going to that secret place. You hit me while I'm on that bulldozer at work, oh, I can turn that brother David into a secret place. I'm getting rooted right there. I'm going down into Christ. That well of living water and this Word is not going to fall to the wayside. It's going to bring forth fruit so that my Father is glorified. I'm going to stand on His Word. Devil, you're not getting our marriage. You're not getting my kids. Because when you hit us, that we ain't got but one place to go, Nathan. I can't go to the bank and get the help that I need. I can't run to my family and get the help that only one place I can go. I'm going to that secret place and I'm going to cry, Abba, Father, I need you. I need an abundance of grace for this moment in my life. God says through that, opened up. We climbed out of ruts. Hey y'all, let's not go back. Turn that around for praise to God. Man, even, even if you've been living in the worst condition you've ever found yourself in, turn it back. Start thanking God. Listen to me. We're not begging God this morning to do something. We're thanking God for what He's already done. Thank you, Lord, that you put me in Christ. Thank you that you've given me an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Thank you that every time I've failed and I've fallen, Jesus never failed. 
Thank you, Lord, that my righteousness comes from another. It comes from your Son. Thank you that my holiness comes from another. It comes from your Son. Thank you that it's not by my works, but it is a gift of God. Just thank God for His gift this morning. Would you just testify to the Lord, God, I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded that nothing, not one thing that comes against me in my life will be able to separate me from the love that you've given me in Jesus. Ask Him to give you roots this morning. God, I'm sorry for the times when it's gotten tough that I ran to other things. start feeling sorry for yourself and you become unresponsive you just put God on the back burner while you stay in a place of self pity and sorrow maybe you turn to the things of the world to ease your mind and your pain but you just tell him this morning God instead of that I want roots I want to be and grounded in Christ Jesus. I'm not tossed to and fro by the waves of, of this world and the waves of life. I want to be rooted in Jesus. I'm not going to be overcome by life. I want to reign in life with you. this morning. Pray for your spouse. You know, instead of blaming them, pray for them. Lord, man, just pray. Lord, let my wife become rooted in Jesus. Let her see this great love. Oh, ladies, pray for your husband. Like we, like we all do at times. Just pray, God. Lord, conform my husband to the image of Jesus. Make him more like you. I just lift him up to you today, God. And I pray that you change his heart. Pray for your children. by faith apply it every place in life in Jesus name thank you God thank you God thank you Jesus
Wasn't that a great service? I love when God does God things. Uh, before the service, when we were doing worship, I was going to get up there and I was going to read chapter 5 out of, out of Romans, that very same verse. I love when the Holy Ghost speaks through, through us. And I, what I was going to say is where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Yeah. It ain't nothing we can do, work for. It's just given to us. When we, when we were young, you didn't have to teach us to, you know, to do wrong things. We knew it. But even though after all of that, God still gives us His grace. Isn't He precious? Isn't He precious? I thank God for this church and I thank God for our pastor that, that, that he that he preaches the cross, y'all. I do. But y'all, let's come back tonight. We're gonna uh, we're gonna be at the nursing home at two thirty. And uh, the kids are gonna do uh, they're gonna practice worship uh, at one thirty, is that right? Two? Okay, one thirty. Neely says. Well, and tonight we're going we're going to gather back at five. And y'all, it's, it's like Luke said, you know, if you know if God really touched you in this service, you know, come back tonight. You you'll be blessed even more. But most of our, I mean, most of the services I've ever been blessed with, with is on Wednesday and Sunday nights. It's when you know. But uh, but anyway, y'all come back tonight and let's uh, let's lift up the name of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this place today, Lord. And I praise you for your precious son, Lord. Lord, I thank you, my God, for your mighty grace. I thank you, my God, for, for when you see me now, my God, you don't, see, you don't see what I used to be, God. You see your son, and I thank you for that, God. Lord, I thank you for the people that's in this place. And, Lord, I ask you, God, to be with uh, Sister Terry and Brother Robert's family, God, at this time, God, and just comfort them and put peace in their mind, God. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.